Tachaya, uh, to give a talk. Uh, my name is Jin Songleng uh, from Harbin Institute of Technology, China. Uh, let me introduce Professor Debish. Professor Debish is a fellow of Royal Society of New Zealand and a distinguished fellow of Engineering New Zealand. He's also a life member of ASME and the founder of the Center of the Advanced Composite Materials at the University of Auckland. His research interest includes the mechanical and the manufacturing composite materials. With more recent uh, emphasis being on development of ferro tendent additive and the ferro dynamic simulation. He was awarded the uh, Superior Technological Award by Engineer New Zealand and the Dupont Research Award. He has delivered over 70 plenary keynote invite lecture at the international conference and has more than 500 scientific technological publications and a number of the book chapters. So with that, uh, please welcome Professor David Bhattacharya. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Jin Sung Leng. Jin Sung has been a long time friend, so I must acknowledge and uh, that I will try to finish within time. Yeah, I said that it might go between 50 and 55 minutes, but since then I've deleted one or two, three or four slides. Let us start and then we can have other uh, uh, chats if necessary. Uh, I will also acknowledge two of my colleagues there, names are there, Velram Balaji Mohan, Dr. Mohan also contributed, and Justin George, he's finishing his PhD under my supervision now. Also, um, the couple of previous PhD students, Hamid Sori and Aggie Kurian, I will show uh, their, some of their slides. Hamid is now in Europe, Aggie, she is working here, and other, our technical colleagues, yours, Callum Turnbull, Stephen, and of course, Ministry of Business, Employment, and Innovation, who provided us uh, with a long-term grant. Now, those who are not familiar with geography, I'll quickly go through this. This, this is New Zealand. In fact, um, uh, away from Australia, here you can see, and there, the, there, is New Zealand and Auckland is the uh, biggest city in Northern Ireland. In fact, the biggest city in New Zealand itself, about one third of New Zealand's population, which is around 5 million, um, live in and around Auckland. Auckland picture, it is divided in just like Sydney, two parts, North Harbour and the main city, and they are connected by a bridge called Harbour Bridge. So from Harbour Bridge, you can have this view when you come from North, uh, North Harbour, you see that uh, this is the main CBD, CBD area and at night also, this is our sky tower and uh, various other things. And New Zealanders are very keen on sailing. That is why always you will see a few boats sailing there. And that was the reason we started our research in composite, ma composite materials area. And this is another view because our, our, our we are located, this is our main campus and main engineering building. This is the main engineering building. There are two parallel buildings like that. And also this is the business school. And But we are located in a slightly different area, about one and a half kilometers away called New Market Campus because we have got much, much larger uh, area available there, facilities. And now, uh, Jin Sung, for you also, you'll be interested to know, we have now merged and renaming the center as Center for Advanced Materials Manufacturing and Design, CAMMD, because the, um, this 3D printing group, advanced manufacturing group, they have decided to join us so we are merging, two groups are merging. So we have now access to their fantastic, some of the manufacturing facilities, and they have got facilities for our man, uh, materials development. Also recently, we got a very large grant on um, plastics processing, polymer processing, secondary, how to recycle plastics. So that, that way, the group is expanding in that direction a bit. Now, overall, I am not going to dwell upon this. We'll start with, as usual, graphene and initial work of 
RGO, we interacted with uh, HIT there, um, but also some of the joint publications uh, took place. Then from then on, we have done other some other work. I'll try to present, also finish with actual biochar because we are trying to move away from graphene or uh, um, uh, even our reduced graphene oxide if possible and see whether biochar because it is very cheap, easily available. And I'll show you some results there. Justin is working on that. The work is not finished yet, but I'll show you some preliminary results. Um, you are very familiar with this. This is the typical graphene that uh, if you have a single layer, if, if it is at all uh, possible, if you want to get a single layer, this kind of uh, graphene, it also is very energy consuming. It might be quite expensive. So sometimes we compromise. We have got multi-layer uh, graphene uh, particles. We use them. Also, we use sometimes graphite. From graphite to graphene, we can manufacture. And you can see these are the classifications we can have, like CNT. If you roll it up, it will become a tube. It could be single layer, multi layer, or graphitic things could be like that in single layer. And fullerenes could be also there, part of that, and could be uh, carved as well. So these are theoretical values. Let us not spend too much time. Theoretically, graphene could be very, very high. Young's modular stiffness, ultimate strength is very high. Means you can see it is in terapascal range, TPA, not MPA, terapascal, and very high uh, electrical conductivity. Although for regular usage, I'll show you graphene that we use commercially available, or even if you manufacture yourself, conductivity, conductivity will be much less. Now, these are the possibilities that you, if you have a flexible background or back, back material, you can have flexible uh, things manufactured with that. I will discuss today a couple of things. One will be this kind of flex, flexural, flexible devices, this kind of thing with stretchable sensors. Uh, with Herman Institute, we have used this with shape memory polymer also that paper was pu published. You, If you are interested, you can talk to Professor Leng. And also I'm going to use that similar thing for um, purposes, we'll use um, biocarbon or biochar. So let us start with the simple thing which we started doing, hybrid composites. Now if we have a thermoplastic polymer, we have got and plus graphene material, we can have improved mechanical properties because of addition of graphene also, but because of thermoplastics we have got a low electrical, low electrical properties. Whereas if we have conducting polymers plus graphene, then we can have very good electrical properties, no question about it, but we have got low mechanical properties. So the compromise is that we add something else in between and thermoplastic plus conducting material plus graphene materials. Can we merge these two so that we have a win-win situation? We'll have good improved mechanical properties, we'll have improved electrical properties, and at the same time, um, it might be flexible as well. Let us see. So we are trying to combine thermoplastic material, conducting polymer, and then graphene together. To do that, essentially with a cartoon, if I try to express that you have a two-component composite that graphene, geo, and polymer matrix, but if you add something, lol, I am calling it hybridization, hybrid polymer, add polypyrrole or polyaniline particles to enhance the interparticle connectivity. So we are trying to do that, to add that. That is the purpose of this work. So essentially, if we write in steps, you have primary bulk polymers, could be polypropylene, could be poly 
पॉलीमेथिल मिथाइल मेथाक्रिलेट पीएमएमए और पॉलीऑक्सी मेथिलिन पीओएम दैट्स द प्राइमरी पॉलीमर लार्ज क्वांटिटी सेकेंडरी कंडक्टिंग पॉलीमर स्मॉलर अमाउंट कुड बी पॉलीपाइरोल और पॉलीएनिलिन एंड पॉलीपाइरोल इज फेयरली एक्सपेंसिव सो यू माइट समटाइम्स गो फॉर पॉलीएनिलिन बट पॉलीपाइरोल गिव्स यू मच बेटर रिजल्ट एंड देन द रीइंफोर्समेंट यू कैन ब्रिंग इन विथ आर जीओ और इन फैक्ट ग्रेफीन पॉलीमर सो यू आर जी ओ वी मैन्युफैक्चर आर सेल्स वी कुड गेट अप टू हंड्रेड एंड थ्री हंड्रेड एंड फाइव सीमेंट्स पर सेंटीमीटर एंड द ग्रेफीन दैट वी परचेज फ्रॉम टू सोर्सेज वन फ्रॉम चाइना वन फ्रॉम स्पेन बोथ गेव अराउंड द सेम वन हंड्रेड थर्टी हंड्रेड थर्टी फाइव सीमेंट्स पर सेंटीमीटर so we tried a some kind of experimental analysis or taguchi analysis we combined four sets there that reduced graphene oxide polypyrrole and polymers reduced graphene oxide polyaniline and, and polymers graphene polypyrrole and polymer graphene po graphene polyaniline and polymer and we varied the combinations and all these things so that i am not going into those details as long as you get the snapshot of the type of results we are trying to get so rgu and g both were used both polypyrrole and poly polyaniline were, was uh, were used and then some kind of polymer was used there and by doing rgu loading we thought electrical conductivity really reaches maximum and then it comes down this was very early work so we did not simply depend on that i'll show you we modified the experimentation technique we modified the results we modified various things so and quick manufacturing process was well, that twin screw extruder mixing the compounds hybridization then electrical conductivity was tested and tensile testing was done in an instron machine so if we plot results well it is mean still it is conducting but we were not happy if you look at that the best conductivity we could get was 0.8 sort of siemens per centimeter that was for combination 5 and this was the second more or less combination 3 and 7 had similar conductivity but half of that value and the mechanical properties uh, was well more or less quite, quite a few of them were pretty high but if you look at them if you increase use your engineering judgment you will say that okay number 5 was a good compromise between conduct electrical conductivity and mechanical property you might say okay i can forego those uh, conductivity a little and but we will increase the strength then you can go for that you can go for you can go for this as well so it's up to you but the results were not bad but we were not happy because it was still about 0.8 um we wanted to get much higher much higher conductivity so what we did was and these are the combinations you see 5 5 3 7 you can see how how we combine this was done with melt melt blending process and we found the reason also by doing some um, scanning electron micrographs you can see that sometimes the agglomeration is there sometimes you have got cracks and cracks means you have got detachment detachment also created uh, uh, higher resistivity so these are the various things we studied and you can do and we have published and i'll give you some references there but the interesting thing is we thought that this was really public uh, and journal of smart and nano materials so we published there that how a polymer this hybridization can improve the overall conductivity and result and this is called also termed as bridged double percolation this has been found in fiber composites as well that you can for how much longish fibers you can use some particles or shorter fibers we can bridge 
and bridge and protect the cracks and that's how we improve the properties. But then if we just um, summarize the outcomes, mill blending highest we have shown up to 0.8 but highest we can see go up to 0.9 Siemens per centimeter or something like that. So formation of agglomerations, we can see that both RGO and G hybrids exhibit similar final properties with very little variation. So we had two publications, Advanced Composite Materials and Journal of Smart and Nano. That was the beginning. Then we thought, instead of male blending, if we go for solution casting, <clears throat> then what sort of result we might get? Because our ultimate goal was 3D printing and with that sort of conductivity, we were not prepared to venture into those things. So we thought solution casting in situ, only problem was that POM, which gave the highest conductivity in melt blending, cannot be used in solution casting method as it is highly resistant to solvents. So we had to compromise immediately as soon as we started thinking of um, modifying the method solution casting to solution casting we had to compromise. We could not use POM. Instead we went for the second best which was PMMA and we used that and results were pretty good which gave second highest electrical conductivity with male bending and it dissolved in a range of solvents, that's why. What we also did, we added sucrose this time, sugar, just sucrose, a very small amount, added as a compatibilizer to improve the ductility of the composites. It has a natural tendency to facilitate electron flow. I'll show you how it improves the result. So now we have got primary bulk polymers, you can see here we have deleted POM. We don't have that. We have PMMA, we have got PLA, biodegradable, and also we can have PETG, which is also bio, um, it is acceptable within the human system, this PET. And secondary for conducting polymer, same polypyrrole and polyaniline, reinforcement. This time we stuck to only GNP, didn't use RGO, and additive was sucrose, very small amount, about 1%. So quick combination, fabrication process is very similar. These are the really block diagram. You, you have much more, uh, you need much more detail actually to achieve that. So it go for mixing, coagulation, and then drying. Then we could actually filaments and strips, we could manufacture by putting through a, a 3D printing machine. So it has sufficient ductility by putting sucrose. Without that sort of, without that ductility, it would be very difficult to uh, 3D print because it will, it will be brittle, it will crack quite often. So what we did, if we plot the results, top one is the, the old result. We had, and forget about this because this was with POM, we could not do that. But we have got, if we plot on the same graph, milk blended specimens practically gave nothing. Best of them M6 was, point, M5 was 0.5, but we had very little with other combinations. Whereas now we have got solution casting, we have got M4, M5, M6, M7. All of them, all of them were almost one order of magnitude higher. In fact, highest was M6, which gave us 14.2 Siemens per centimeter. Compared to 0.8, we went to 14.2 Siemens per centimeter, which was very high. No question about it. So it was very high. So we figured out also, you do scanning micrographs and say that PMMA fracture surface showing well dispersed graphene particles. That is why M6 gave better results. Whereas E1, 
uh, had fracture surface and large filler material, there were agglomerations. So that is why the result was not that good. If we go back one, E1 is pretty low and M6 is very high. So you compare E1, E1 result with means one order of magnitude higher. Means actually more than one order. That means 100 times higher. So two orders of magnitude are better. So at least we got that. And then it had sufficient ductility that we could also produce these 3D printed where not only that, these 3D printed uh, dog bone specimens, these are also 3D printed. So we use a very, very cheap uh, 3D printer. Now uh, we are using much more expensive 3D printers, but for student projects and all the time, if we want to use, we did not want to occupy a really good machine. We were trying out on a cheaper machine, but we did. And our feed rate, you can see 100 millimeter per minute. That also you can control. And really that controlling that, you can control the quality of the specimen and the properties. So in, an, in short, due to brittle nature, POM and PMMA based composites, both in blending on solution casting, we also explored LDPE. So the polyethylene, low density polyethylene, uh, linear low density polyethylene, so that we can have even better ductility. And although sucrose did provide some ductility there, we wanted to see what sort of, whether we lose too much conductivity there or whether we don't. So we also started with 92% LDP, polypyrrole was there, 28%, and graphene was 6 or 8%. 3D printed GNP LLDP composites were manufactured and compared with uh, compression molded composites. Properties were very good. Mechanical properties were generally higher than actually compression molded properties. But the electrical properties, our, uh, some of them were very good, but it was heading a lot. It was really not that consistent. So I'm not going to harp on that. We are, uh, we worked on that and we did improve for a particular industry project, uh, which I'm not going to discuss, but I'm saying that finally we did put something else so that you can improve both mechanical and electrical properties. So now if we do concluding that electrical conductivity of 14.2 Siemens per centimeter was achieved with M6 combination and hybrid variation of PMMA PD of graphene with sucrose has been shown to improve ductility with no significant increase in resistivity. So electrical conductivity was not, uh, did not decrease very much, but because of improved ductility, we could feed through the 3D printer, filament fed 3D printer, no problem and successful 3D printed samples, we lost a bit of conductivity. Actually, um, your comments would be uh, welcome there. We could not exactly figure out what the reason was. Could have been some of the micro cracks and some detachment there. That is why the conductivity went down from 14 to about 11 Siemens per centimeter. It was still high, but it was lower than this simple the filament, but when you produce 3D printed actual uh, bone, dog bone specimens, you we lost the conductivity slightly there. We could not identify the exact reason for that, but let us move to the next thing that whether we can use this kind of technique now for our flexible sensors. Well, that's what our uh, main, uh, one of the main purposes was. So we tried to have the flexible sensors for fingers, for skin, for throat, for dialogue, for various things, knee joints, elbow joints. I'll show you some examples. And each of them has been published. So if you want more details, 
you should be able to get the more get more details from those published papers. First part one, I'm going to say low temperature coefficient of resistance for large strain sensors. So first of all, those who are not familiar with some of the terminologies, if you have any specimen you try to stretch, then <clears throat> electrical resistance uh, of the material will change as applied stress. Applied stress means applied strain also, it will strain. Because of that, the actual resistance will change. And that is very interesting because that is a basic principle of your strain gauge material as well. Strain gauge, why does it change? Because of the change of the, the because there is a um, uh, displacement, because of the displacement, there are the resistivity changes and that's how we measure the strain. Here, the principle is the same more or less, but we are talking about large strain, not very small amount. But a small strain, you can have a linear relationship here. It may not have that. But gauge factor is a good indication what sort of sensitivity you have got. Gauge factor is defined by this delta R over R, how the resistance is changing divided by delta L over L. So delta over R and divided by epsilon, the strain, that is given as the gauge factor. Now, we also use polymer silicone rubber so that the stretchability is improved and composite sensors have several attributes. And we also use the inclusion of carbon particles. I will show you, we use various things, carbon particles, carbon nanotubes, graphene, carbon black, all those things and how they affected. The advantages are there because some of those materials could be quite, means carbon black is quite cheap. You can use them and, and you can, if you, and sometimes you can have hybrid of graphene and carbon black to get the best results. I'll show you some of those pictures that will make the things clearer. Now with that background, let us see the biggest problem we find the con reorientation of con when you stretch they try to orientate inside materials <coughs> sorry will rotate towards the stretching direction so that reorientation of conductive network it will reorientate of conducting network will create, so, so sometimes you have to have this tunneling, tunneling effect. In physics, if you look at that, instead of climbing a hill, put the stone up and going like that, it is much easier if you can have a tunnel and you can drag that through this, underneath this hill. But to create the tunnel, you need some effort. You can't get this tunnel um, uh, easily. You have seen how many, you have got railway tracks, you have got various things through tunnels. So tunnels will have to be created to make an easier path. So that would be the goal. So we are going to concentrate on that principal factors. And so how to get that? We chose carbon black to hybridize graphene nanoplatelets. So why carbon black? It is cheap, conductive, and spherical dimensional stability. So what do we mean by that? Forget about this part of the manufacturing, very similar, that you, you dissolve, you have got that. We are adding carbon black. Instead of having this cast film, you have got the graphene platelets like that. We are putting some carbon black composites and where carbon black the spherical may, may, be, may not be comparable there dimensionally, but they are going inside and making some kind of connectivity. Then they are allowing actually some kind of um, is contact between those platelets or if anything wants to go or if you have anything, any flow, that will be helped by those, those little uh, carbon black 
particles. They are not as big as them because they are carbon black. They are, they are helping that. So by doing that, we also created some very flexible sensor. I mean, even with 300% stretching, it did uh, very, very much. It stretched. You can also twist. And there was a publication of that. We have published sensors and actuators say that how this carbon black can help, in fact, maintaining that this uh, conductivity or help that uh, your um, nanoplatelets to maintain, to get this kind of tunneling effect. So you can see them even by having uh, uh, microscopic pictures. You see that how those platelets, that those uh, carbon black particles have infiltrated inside those. Um, this is the picture. Driven stacking of they won't go and touch each other. That is, it will. There will be something in between the two platelets. So that is one thing. So there will be some kind of opening there between the two rather than very rigid contact. When we did that, as you know, all stretching sensors are uh, um, tested over time, over cycles, so that repeatability is there. Yeah, I have shown over 1,000 seconds. I've got this actual, he, her thesis, uh, you show that 5,000 cycles, 10,000 cycles, she has checked, and it is pretty stable. You can see the result is reasonably stable uh, uh, over time and this. So if we have this, you can see that this did work. Graphene, carbon black, silicon rubber, and 100% strain, 300% strain. It is very stable. So that was one thing. We have used that material for stretchable wearable sensors also. So if we summarize what we have discussed. Flexible and stretchable sensors are, are, were fabricated with graphene silicon rubber, carbon black silicon rubber, and graphene carbon black silicon rubber. So first two are one element and silicon rubber, but second one was hybrid composites. And they were always among the studied sensors. This one, graphene, carbon black, silicon rubber, hybrid sensors have shown excellent and balanced, sorry, it should be balanced sensing performance. So it was also uh, shown significant temperature stability and cyclic stretching and relaxing from hybrid composites to be durable with stable electromechanical performance. So, so both temperature wise stable, electromechanical performance it is stable, and it is also sensing performance wise it was very stable. So hybrid sensor were much better. That was the purpose of writing that paper. I'll also show some of the electronic based on conductive natural materials. Because natural materials could be very, very cheap. So I'm, I'm going to show some of these and some of, all of them have been published. So I'll give you the references. Natural materials we have got can be cost-effective, biodegradable with good mechanical properties. But they are insulating nature. Often if you take a cloth, if you take uh, flax fiber, they are not conducting. So uh, flax fabric, you are not conducting. So insulating nature in terms of electrical conductivity can limit their applications in the Areas that high electrical conductivity is crucial, such as sensing, heating elements. So we are, we will in the next few slides. I'll to, I'll show you how we overcame that. Some of how we could overcome that that, that kind of uh, problem. How much time do I have? Okay, I've got fifteen more minutes. And uh, so we have got GNP carbon black already. We have shown that uh, hybrid composites are better, so we did not want to waste any more time. We actually started with uh, this um, graphene nanoplatelets plus carbon black, 
and started with uh, flax. I'll show you various materials, flax yarn, flax bleached yarn, B, you can see it is white, then wool, then cotton, and then under ultra high strength, um, medium, uh, what is that, polyethylene thing as well. Um, but braids, we use that spectra. This is available in the market. So we used all sorts of natural and one material. I'll show you results only for the natural materials. So typical procedures, you can have electrophoretic deposition, ultrasonication, stirring, modified deep coating, spray coating, all sorts of things. And instead of really going through the details that how we control temperature left and side was 20 degrees centigrade, 1500 RPM, we controlled, we dipped, we, it is time consuming. You have to allow this to this and conductive ink. You can see it is dipped. And I'm not going to explain this uh, Taguchi whole table, but one thing we can say that we also added some sodium SBDS, okay? Sodium, what? Dodi cycle, Dodi cycle, cycle benzene sulfonate. Uh, we did add that, but by doing that, you can see how the platelets with those carbon black particles, with the platelets can go inside. It is only for deposition time, six minutes. Gap size was 10 millimeter. Base material flax bleached. You can use flax original, not bleached. SBDS was one gram and type of electro stainless steel we use and set of experiments. If you do, so we also published this one in International Journal of Nan Smart and Nanomaterials in 2018. That was the first piece of thing done with this natural material and we thought we'll report that. Now I'll show you a better picture after that. Procedure two, we went from just one fabric there that one fabric we tried to have conducting flax yarn, tried to and also add did ultrasonication from 3 to 20 minutes, slight variation of the properties, and also conducted a side of Taguchi type analysis. We also, it was published in Materials and Design in 2018. So we did. Uh, have that and try to see how material can improve. And this is very interesting. You see the deposition time, it is expected, but sudden jump after about 10 minutes deposition time, the conductivity average value of electrical conductivity jumps from here to there and then it becomes very high. But on the other hand, this is over sample number, it is more or less steady. So it is, but you must remember, this is Siemens per meter. So centimeter would be much less than that. Still it is high, 4.4, 2.38. So not bad, but I'm saying that there is some kind of sonic deposition time. We also notice sonication time had a very, very big influence. So once we got that sort of manufacturing fabrication procedure uh, more or less under control, then we thought, let us have a look. Have a look at that fiber yarn, what has happened. It is very interesting, whether you can see or not, but I am prone uh, <clears throat> schematically that in fact, you can see the carbon black particle has gone inside there and GNPs are there, there, and all these GNPs are getting you know, in the long, longitudinal direction there. And exactly as we explained a, a few slides before back that, just a minute, this, that can go inside, here we have the same thing, that uh, carbon black, carbon black has gone inside those nanoplatelets and, and the fabric is there. And it has become white uh, from you know, deposition time, we increase from three to 20 minutes. And the, these, are the, these are the process parameters you can play around with. Uh, it is, there is nothing fixed. You can say, 
I will do for 15 minutes. Somebody will say 25. I'm trying to show a trend there that if you increase, you will improve that. But the basic principle is very important that carbon black is going between those uh, graphene nanoplates layers. We use them uh, without going into the details of manufacturing because it was again published uh, Materials and Design 2018. We put them in uh, somebody's, we had to take permission um, in the vocal thing you can see uh, there. The student volunteered himself also on the finger and tried to see the response. Response was very stable. Uh, um, gauge factor was not that high, but not bad, 5.6 or so. People, when they get 10, they said, we have got very high gauge factors. We got extremely high gauge factors. I'll show you later. But it is very stable. You can see from the left-hand side, results are stable. We could, he, the, uh, he did say various things. And when he pronounced, depending on the, um, um, syllable he was saying, we had the different types of responses there. So it was working. Then we thought that instead of having this one yarn, we can have a little fabric there and two conductive. One will be conductive cotton and another one will be conductive, conductive wool, CC and CW. And we followed a very similar procedure and we saw that even for little heat source, you can have that with wool fabrics. Wool was used, conducting cotton and wool. And that was published in ACS Journal, Applied of Material Interfaces, 2018. Um, ACS Applied um, as an American Chemical uh, Society. So they are Applied uh, Material Interfaces, good journal. So uh, the heat source or other things also we have established quite a bit there that all the results we established. Now, another thing we twisted that it, because it is very difficult to get the fabric in a real stretch form, you will have wrinkles there. You will have those undulations. So we have CWY1, which is straight, CWY2, which has got that undulation, which has got CWY3, which has got two undulations, followed the same process, more or less, and got the results. Got the results, and if you see that um, result, it, it is depositing all right, no problem there. No problem, it is responding. If you use the finger uh, responses, yeah, you see the blue glove is there, and there that we have responses. But, important thing, when you plot that, we also published this in Sensors and Actuators A2018 that, Hamid Sore, that if you have the straight one, then you have got this GF, gauge factor can improve from five, and then there are two regimes. Then in the second regime, it can go close to eight. So it can have a significant jump in the gauge factor if you have, I mean, strain percentage is changing, if you have a straight uh, fabric. So it has got some implications. So for manufacturing, it can jump from 5 to 7.5, 7.5. So what is there? What is the conclusion? Well, all three of them responded pretty well. But larger strain movements induced by the red one Induced by bending the volunteer's wrist, elbow, and knee have also been recognized by a CWY1 strain sensor. And the strain, what, what was that? CWY1 was the straight one. So, there is a hint for manufacturing. How are you, are you going to keep that straight? Keep them under slight tension so that all these wrinkles... In many composites manufacturing also, we try to avoid any fabric wrinkling or uh, pre-existing fiber wrinkling because that always, if there is a wrinkle, <clears throat> it is can be the source of some kind of perturbation in the future. So it is better. We published a long time ago a paper in 
Journal of Applied Mechanics, uh, my student Richard Christie, myself, and Ian Collins, we wrote that any fabric, so manufacturing, it is better to keep them under slight tension so that it is, it remains straight. And then you can see lovely deposition there and it works very well. So finally, we also use, some people said that if you have a fragmented fabric, you can have a very serious jump because of the change of resistivity. It's quite amazing. I, I honestly, initially when Amit started working on that, I did not, I was not, not so enthusiastic. But you see that when we found, I'll show you some results. We published all the results in Journal of Materials Chemistry C. Um, and it was fantastic when you have this, some tear or some kind of uh, gap there that base strain sensor possesses stable and reliable behavior, sorry, possesses stable behavior with respect to applied tensile strains. Response time is very low, 97 milliseconds. And GF in some parts, if you calculate, whether you believe it or not, gauge factor is very, very, very high. Very high. It is act somewhat artificial because it's not, this gauge factor is not valid for the whole specimens, but in some parts, if you calculate, it is very high. Overall, you get, if you get a control tear or control gap in the fabric, you can get much better result. And that is what we tried to say in this paper, Journal of Materials Chemistry C. So overall summary of this part, I will take only five more minutes. I'll finish after that. Systematic study on air, yeah, well, we can say that flax ions can go up to 580 siemens per meter. So it is really 5.8 siemens per centimeter if you want. And it has been a, a very straight sensing found that a straight sensing element, that's what I was trying to explain, conductive wool yarn, uh, uh, that element, uh, sorry, it should be results, it is a grammatical missing results in better sensing response compared to that. And creation of controlled intentional cracks and fractures within the conductive networks of particles has been found to be a promising way to significantly improve the sensing ability of the strain sensors. It's not very easy to create them. You have to have control and that control, we need to do much more research. In fact, to have that kind of control, I mean, it is worth doing more research on what sort of control we need, which orientation would produce the best result. With that, I've given you a summary of this, all this graphene, carbon black, graphene nanoplates. Right? Finishing part, currently we are also working with very much with biochar, both for the fire resistance properties, fire extinguishing property, also for the electrically conductive biocarbon. Uh, as you know, the biocarbon is uh, very good for pyrolysis. Many people claim it is to be carbon zero, I, 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 I have some problem there. It also uses energy, but it's far less than many other processes. Cost-effective, sustainable biocarbon is mixed and biocarbon can be produced very easily. Biocarbon is very dependent, biochar particle size and the nature of the surface dependent on the temperature. So left-hand side, we have got coconut shell biocarbon from coconut shell. And another is, it is the, this uh, pine wood biochar. And this is actually the same one in the powder form. Uh, I, instead of going that through this D band and G band, is, well, uh, we can explain, but let us have the overall picture first, clear, uh, clearer picture. So we have taken the CT, uh, micro CT, to show that how they densify when you increase the percentages of these kind of uh, carbon or this um, biochar, biocarbon, 
particles, you can easily see how they are densifying. And that's how after a certain percentage, you get problems rather than benefits. We have published some of our um, initial results. We have published in um, Express Polymer Letters uh, from there and um, this uh, 2021. And you can see with carbon polypropylene, we added this thing, the actually peak is shifting to the right. So mel melting temperature is increasing. Now, 3D printing, we use very similar technique prior to that, that uh, filament was produced, double mixing, cone mixing, then we produced filament and we added something uh, PVAT and because it is PLA, PLA is brittle, so we had to add some PVAT there. PVAT adds some kind of some ductility there and then biochar composites. We produced dog bone specimens, we produced other types of specimens also. Uh, without any problem, we have. These are the various combinations we have used. 80-20, 79-20, yeah, with all these mixtures. We, we go on trying and to an extent, it is a bit trial and error, but we try to create an overall picture where we should. We try to keep PBAT percentage as constant as possible and biochar. Uh, we did not want to go too high because that creates problem in the actual printing process. So you can see that we have got the highest one is the red, uh, which is pH 79, 20, and 1% biochar uh, in, in the, from the tensile strain point of view. From the electrical conductivity, elongation very similar. Electrical conductivity point of view, very similar, but we wanted to have a little more biochar. That, that is why you have, you have to have a compromise. We are going through a complete uh, Taguchi style analysis now to find out what the um, suboptimized conditions should be. You may have to sacrifice a bit of strength, but increase the uh, electrical property. And yeah, so we have given some contusion, these typical scanning micrographs, that how the particles are going inside. You can see lovely picture there that you, you see there, there, there. They have gone infiltrated there. Uh, Interfacially, end up between biochar and polymer matrix, you increase uh, and then Essentially, schematic diagram is PLA, PBAT, these things are plotting, and biochar is there, and biochar has got some kind of, we are trying to create some, some sort of functional property. So the biochar normally is very inert. You don't get any functional property created on that. But if you control the temperature, high temperature biochar, Normally, we do biochar in 750, 900 degrees C, but we are using a tube furnace here. We are going to a very high temperature, about 1200, 1400 degrees C. Then you create some properties, but you have to use them very quickly. You cannot leave them for a very long time to get some properties. So you see that um, this is a table. You see how biocarbon we have changed from uh, was zero to ten percent, and we are have that. Uh, this applied sciences we have published the papers in the addition of ten decrease the surface resistivity of composites. So two orders of magnitude resistivity. If it problem is ten percent is very good. Now with that sort of material, it you may find it is difficult to three D print. So. Uh, depending on the eventual application, but it is very good from the increased uh, conductivity point of view, decreased resistivity, two orders of magnitude. So carbon black can be done. Also, we use pine wood because that's the available material in New Zealand, and you can take a chunk of pine wood and really make it conducting. 
by applying the proper temperature and environment. We did that. With that, we, we, the conductivity drastic increase. Uh, we could go up to 0.7 uh, Siemens per centimeter um, to 11 Siemens per centimeter by changing the conductivity uh, of um, pyrolysis temperature. We could. Um, uh, we are a bit sensitive there. I'm not giving all the details, but improved to 12.6 Siemens per centimeter for like 1200 degrees C. So it is very sensitive to temperature. As I said, a block pine wood can, we can create an electrode out of that. We have gone that far. It is very, very, and Justin is writing up his thesis and then we'll have, uh, this is, these are some of the things that how it changes from 1000 degrees centigrade, 1200 degrees centigrade, how the honeycomb structure is completely broken into this kind of powder form, and we are using them after pyrolysis, graphitic cluster. Uh, let us not waste time, not waste, let us not spend time on that round spectrum. We have done all the things, and then strain sensor also we have managed flexible and stretchable strain sensor with, with the silicon rubber, and that is pretty stable. In fact, we have made a human heart rate. We have measured. Um, uh, gauge factor is the lower side, in my opinion. We should be able to improve even further. 2.3 gauge factor. So it is possible. What I'm trying to say that even instead of expensive graphite, graphene material or anything, we might be able to use commonly available biochar using common wood or pine wood or even coconut shell or some other uh, nut shell, you can produce biochar from there and use them instead of using um, carbon nanotube platelets or carbon black. So that is the essentially, I want to say, in the final part. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hello, Professor Debit. Uh, my name is Guo Zhanglong, a faculty member of Professor Len's group. Uh, yep. Professor Len needs to uh, deal with an urgent matter. So <laughs> yeah. on behalf of Professor Len and the International Journal of Smart and Nanomaterials, I will chair the uh, question and answer session. Uh, That's fine. I hope you're, yeah, I yeah, hope you're okay with that. Um, yeah, yeah, we, that was the whole idea. Okay, That's thank you. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, uh, and let me briefly summarize what uh, Professor Debis has uh, shared with us. So, Professor Debis, thanks very much for your fantastic and uh, comprehensive uh, uh, lecture for us. Uh, so, Professor Debis starts from uh, talking about the difference, the brief difference between uh, graphene and the reduced graphene oxide, and then uh, shared with us uh, uh, why uh, using uh, hybrid uh, composites. And especially, uh, Professor Debis shared with us uh, the selection of materials based on, for example, Taguchi analysis. And then, and then shared with us the manufacturing methods uh, for hybrid uh, nanocomposites on all composites. For example, using 3D printing or added to manufacturing. And then uh, Professor Debis shared with us uh, how we can use those uh, uh, composites for, uh, for example, flexible sensing, uh, and smart clothing uh, and, and many other applications. And later on, Professor Debbie shared with us uh, uh, about the natural fiber materials for sensing applications. And Professor Debbie's uh, talk aims on the about biocarbon uh, and the manufacturing of biocarbon and its application. Okay, before I take the uh, questions uh, from the audience, I have one quick question uh, from your PPT slide, Professor Debbie. Yes. You mentioned about a very interesting and a very high gauge factor of around uh, 100K. Uh, so because it, it's a little bit short on that slide, can you please uh, yes, elaborate yes. a little bit more on that slide? As I said mechanism? that you have to deal that with a little bit of circumspection. We did check quite a, uh, this one, I think. Uh, yes. yes yeah. The, the, we did check, quite, and I said it is not the overall thing, but in some ranges, 
it looked like if you calculate theoretically the gauge factor, it's very, very high. And it is very high. And when we published that in Journal of Materials Chemistry C, we did say that we have not fully understood why it okay. happened like that. And the reviewers came back and both of them said that, yes, it is. A, it might be possible, but they also don't know. But they said that it is good to be reported. If you have any explanation, please let okay, us I understand. know. Because I, 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 uh, we did check. We that uh, the the doctoral student was. He is now in Europe. He's working there. He was very thorough. He did check meticulously, but theoretically, we were getting that kind of result, which surprised me as well. I tell you, yeah. I, yeah, this is quite surprising and exciting as well. Oh well, uh, yes, exciting if we, but we it was repeatable. We did. Uh, repeat every experiment five times, and in that particular range, we are getting very high gauge factor. And maybe we should try to um, do more experiments in that range and see why why it is happening. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, I thought of reporting so that you can also think about start thinking about it. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor. Normally, Davis. all our gauge factors were as you as expected, around 20, 28, 30. Mm -hmm. We are getting 30, 40 quite often, no problem there. But this was unusually high. Initially, I thought it was a miscalculation, so I checked all the numbers myself. Okay, okay. Yes, so this is the answer. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, now I take the uh, questions from the audience. Okay, so there is one audience saying that, uh, Soft and uh, stretchable conductors are useful for home uh, human uh, motion monitoring, as they can be bent, uh, compressed, stretched, and twisted, and can be yes. easily returned to their original states for large uh, after large deformations. So, one yes. important type of soft conductors is the uh, soft uh, conductive uh, polymer composites, which are a mixture of uh, conductor fillers and polymers, as you mentioned in the presentation. There are yes. many types of conductor fillers, such as uh, silver and gold, liquid metal and the carbonaceous materials such as graphene and the reduced graphene oxide as you mentioned as well. So yeah. the, the, the audience uh, asks uh, what especially motivates you and your, your group to use graphene or other uh, carbonaceous materials based uh, conductive polymer composites. <clears throat> okay, the main attraction was the conductivity of graphene or carbon black means that is why I presented the first half of, half of my presentation where we notice that if you can create hybrid composites with graphene nanoplatelets and carbon black, you can get very stable, high conductivity. Okay. Now, stretchable material, very common material, everybody has used almost, is the silicon rubber. So we also were dragged into that and used silicon rubber initially. And in fact, very recently, one of my PhD students, she has developed silicon rubber, but in compressive um, sensor rather than stretching sensor. Um, that also has been published. But I'm saying that since then we thought, can we go into other natural material? Can we? Because we were approached by our wool board of New Zealand. Wool is a very common product in New Zealand. So whether wool can be used, whether cotton fabric can be used, that was the motivation for doing this piece of work. If you look at that work we did, cotton fabric and conductive wool, cotton, conductive cotton, conductive wool, whether we okay. can do that. And both of them responded pretty well. But we noticed that when we go into fabric, cotton fabric is much easier to handle, very cheap. Do you know we used one of the fabrics commonly used for lab cleaning. We used one of those fabrics and made, them, made it conducting. And it produced very good results. But at the same time, we noticed that if you have wrinkles in the fabric, that also affects eventually in the stretching mode. I'm not sure about the compression mode, but stretching mode, it does affect the okay. conductivity. And that is why we took these, con and we noticed that if it is straight, 
That means if the if you can keep the yarn under tension, slight tension, so that it is straight, it is much better. Okay, understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the answers from the uh, from Professor Davis. So we have another question from the audience. The audience uh, says, "Thank you very much for your excellent report, Professor Davis. Uh, I'm very interested in the sensors mentioned in your report. I have a question about, uh, for example, if you feel carbon nanotubes in PDMS, uh, silicon elastomer, uh, because feeling the uh, carbon nanotubes in PDMS uh, may produce a stress softening, uh, which means uh, the moonless effect. So yeah. the uh, this audience says." Uh, uh, how to avoid the impact of this part on sensor performance, please. I have not personally worked in that area, so I, okay. should, not, I should not comment from first-hand experience, but I just reviewed a paper without naming the journal. I just reviewed a paper exactly in that area. They are okay. suggesting a few techniques to avoid that kind of effect, how to do, but I, I cannot discuss too much about that paper because then I, I I'm yeah con okay, con that's confidentiality. Fine. <laughs> but I have not worked in that area myself, and I don't want to really comment without knowing much. Okay, no problem. Uh, thank you, Professor Davis. So we got uh, another question from the audience. The audience says, uh, if uh, the conductor material is mixed into the, uh, for example, flexible substrate, uh, how to ensure the uh, the uniformity uh, of the fillers? Yes, that is a very, very good question. In fact, that is why a deposition time, if you look at, I had a slide, deposition time had a huge effect. In fact, if you look at, this is the effect of strain, but there was another one on deposition time. Deposition time has a huge effect on that because if you increase, after a while, it does not, it plateaus. But if you keep it for a very short period of time, I'm trying to find out where that um, uh, slide is. Yeah, yeah. Deposition time up to 10 seconds, if you look at the left-hand car, yeah, there's not much change in the conductivity because uh, exactly as you said, it was not very uniform. There were gaps and everything. But then there is a sudden jump from 10 to 15 you fill in all the voids and practically goes there and up to 20, it improves and then it plateaus. For another one, it plateaued around 10, 15, 15 seconds. So uh, 15 minutes. So time of deposition is also very important. Okay. The ra ra rate at which deposition takes place also is very important. But I fully agree with you that to ensure you have got uniform property, you have to have uniform deposition. Okay, thank you, Professor Davis. So uh, I think I will take the last question from the audience. So this audience says, uh, can biochar sensors be used in vivo? Because you mentioned about the uh, biocompatibility and biodegradability oh, yes. level. Yes. Of the, uh, so, so what is the biocompatibility bio and the biodegradability uh, level of the, those biochar sensors? And then can uh, yeah. biochar sensors be used in vivo, please? Yes, that is why we have gone into really biochar, which is essentially everything from biomaterial, from, um, from coconut shell to um, pine wood. And if you use a material like cotton fabric or wool, cotton fabric is biodegradable very biodegradable. Now, it depends on where you are going to use it. I have worked with a company on biodegradable stents, but the okay, problem okay. is people talk about this biodegradability, but you cannot allow this degradation to take place without any control. You have to have controlled biodegradation. So depending yes. mm. on the usage, exactly, are you going to use within the human body then you have some restrictions on materials. What sort of material you can use? And after biodegradation, what happens? Are you going to use in the environment outside? Then what sort of biodegradation can you use cotton fabric? You have to check that. But that is why I try to give you examples of right from the, the initially flax fiber, single fiber, to flax fabric, to cotton fabric, to wool fiber, and then even the material 
was developed from, from biomaterial like pine wood or whatever you have or, or the nutshell. Okay. So it's a combination. It has you have to you have to judge what the applications are and how long you can allow it to biodegrade or whether you need immediate biodegradation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, Professor Debbie's uh, answers to this question. And uh, thank you, thank you for Pro Professor Debbie's time, precious time for this uh, 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 very brilliant uh, lecture for us. Thank you very much. I think we will thank end you the, for, this lecture here. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor yeah. Debbie. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Hope you have a good day today. Same to you. Bye. Bye-bye.